Hey, I've got a quiz for you. Uh, okay, not, not really a quiz, but a joy assessment. It's really simple. I'm gonna give you a few scenarios to think about, and I want you to rate your level of joy on a scale of one to five, okay? One rating is no joy at all. A five rating is complete joy. Okay, here we go. Here's number one. Your boss recognizes your hard work and gives you a bonus or raise. Is that a one or a five? Number two. Your friend surprises you with tickets to a concert this weekend for your birthday. I know, pretty easy answer, right? Number five. Okay, question number three. You finally book that trip or vacation that you've been saving for months to buy plane tickets for. I bet you could, I listen, I bet I could guess all your answers to all three of those, but what if we changed just one little thing in each of those scenarios? What if it wasn't you who got the raise or you who got the concert tickets or you that booked that trip? What if it was a coworker or a neighbor or just an acquaintance? What happens to your joy rating? And before we talk about why that's so important to think about, I want to welcome you to Journey at Home. That's what this is. I'm Jared, and if you're looking for an honest, helpful, encouraging ideas to make you better at life, then you've come to the right place. This channel is designed to help us all have a better life. And we think when we follow Jesus' example of how to live, we get the best kind of life. So subscribe, choose those notifications, and you'll get this content each week delivered right to you. Now, back to our joy assessment. If you're anything like me, your joy rating probably drops when we talk about good things happening to other people versus good things happening directly to us. And that's not surprising. I mean, it seems like a very normal response to be less excited about the good fortune of others and more excited about our own good fortune. But that's why I wanted to bring up this topic. We're in this series called Hello, My Name is Joy. And according to the World Happiness Report, the U.S., just isn't as happy a place as it once was. As our happiness survey scores keep dropping in the rankings and mental health experts tell us that around the holiday season of Thanksgiving and Christmas, the time of year when gratitude and joy are talked about a lot, depression and sadness actually rise. I'd like that to be different. I'm sure you would too. So we've been exploring what it looks like to live a life full of joy and what we might have to change in order to get the joy we actually want. So in the first episode of the series, we said part of what we need to do is change our perspective. We often base our attitude and our outlook on the current circumstances we find ourselves in, and we've learned that changing our perspective gives us access to joy despite our circumstances. If you missed that one, that, missed that one go back and check it out. However, today, I want you to think about when you find joy. Most of the joy we experience has to do with the things that happen to us. And we get a raise, we get a vacation, we pass the test, someone buys us a special gift, we get a good medical report. I'm not saying that we should, that should, that stuff should make you feel sad or that you shouldn't find joy in good things that happen to you. But here's something to consider. How much joy do you get from the good things that happen to the people around you? And how involved are you in helping the people around you experience those good things in their lives? I mean, think about it this way. Who are the most joyful people you know? You know who I'm talking about. They just seem to be smiling and laughing and positive all the time, even when things aren't really all that great. They actually make you feel better on bad days, like just being around them. How does that person respond when something good happens to you or other people around them? How would you rate their joy response to good that happens to the people around them? I mean, that's an easy answer, right? The most joyful people you know don't let their joy get limited by the good that happens to themselves alone. And, and here's what I know is true for all of us. We'd much rather be around those kind of people than people who only find joy in the things that happen to themselves. There's something really attractive about joy-filled people, especially when they join in celebrating or even working toward the good of the other people around them. I mean, it becomes almost contagious. And here's something else I know about you and me. We all want to be those kind of people who exhibit more joy, who lift other people up, who, who encourage people through hard times. No one wants to be in the category of joyless. So how do we get better at it? I want to go back to the letter we started looking at in the first episode of this series. Paul was one of Jesus's early disciples, and he had gone around the Mediterranean area helping start communities of Jesus followers. And while Paul is sitting in prison, he decides it's a great time to send an encouraging letter to a group of Christians he knew in another city called Philippi. So Paul says this to him. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Paul jumps right to the heart because we all just naturally think about ourselves, our own stuff, our own well-being. 
Most of our day is filled with what's going to make me look good. What will people think if I do this? How will that play out if I say that? We've got enough practical application for the rest of our lives if we just tried to figure out this one thing he tells us to do nothing out of selfish ambition. Am I right? I mean, fine, I'll admit it. This just isn't easy for me. To quit trying to prove how smart I am or trying to prove I'm better than those people or pointing out the flaws in my neighbors and coworkers and nitpicking the things my wife does to annoy me or just plain hoping bad things happen to the people I just don't like, right? So that good things will happen to only me. I, I catch myself so many times just believing I deserve better than what I'm getting out of life. I deserve the best or, or my kids deserve the best. Paul's words here don't let me get away with that kind of attitude. What's the alternative? If I'm not thinking about me, what, Paul? You want me to think about other people? Actually, that's his next line. He says, rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Now, Paul's not saying that, that those people are more valuable than you are. He's not saying you're dirty and they're royalty, so they deserve more than you. Instead, Paul is just saying that what if you just treated people like they were more valuable? What if you acted like the people you live with, the people you work with, the people you see at the sports games and activities you attend, what if you treated them like VIPs, someone you admire and respect? What if you were looking out for what was good for them? The switch Paul is trying to get us to make is simply to go from looking out for what is best for me to what is best for them. We start to consider what is important and good for the people around us, not just what is good for us. And you consider what you would add to the, to the good for that intern at the office, or, or maybe you'd start thinking about what is good for your neighbor and the family sitting next to you at the soccer game, or your little brother who annoys you, or the competitive jerk at the convention. Paul is pointing out that there is a link between our own joy and fulfillment and the way we think about and treat the people around us. So Paul seems to think joy follows humility, that we increase our joy as we invest in the people around us and work in their best interest. And it's no wonder Paul says this, because that's what he saw Jesus do. It, in your relationships with one another, he says, have the same attitude as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Paul says to take a look at how Jesus managed this. Jesus was God himself, and while he could have rightfully just thought about what was good for him and right for him, because, well, I mean, he's God, he didn't do that at all. Instead, he used his own life for the advantage of other people. I mean, that's really challenging. Even if you're not sure what to think about Jesus as being God in the flesh of a human being, or even if you're not sure about Jesus' resurrection, you have to weigh what Paul says here. Paul believed Jesus was God. And yet Paul is saying that the God he follows does not use his power and authority and position just for the good of himself. So Jared, what does this have to do with being joyful? Well, because people loved being around Jesus. I mean, if you look through the stories told by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you start counting all the times that people went looking for Jesus or invited Jesus over for dinner or wanted him to come hang out with them. I mean, just let me ask you, how many times... Do you feel like being around a sad, old, grumpy person who only thinks about themselves and selfishly works for his own benefit? I mean, how many dinners do you look forward to having with a person who just complains about life and about how hard they've got it and how terrible everything is going for them? I mean, I know, you don't even have to answer because I, I know, n never. <laughs> Jesus must have been one of the most joyful people ever. I mean, there are stories about children even love being around him and kids don't like being around people who are grumpy. Kids are full of fun and play and life. And so if they wanted to be around Jesus, he must have been full of those things as well. I mean, how did Jesus do it? How could he have been joyful despite having so many critics? How could he have, been, have so much joy when he spent most of his time looking out for the interests of the people around him? Because selflessness sets us up for joy. Paul writes this really practical advice to his friends at the end of this part. And he, he, hopefully it lands with all of us. He says, do everything without grumbling or complaining. So Paul, you're saying do nothing out of selfish ambition and do everything without grumbling. I know, right? That seems like a paradox, but that is what Paul points out is the access to joy that we miss out on every day. We miss joy because we don't celebrate the success of others like we would our own success. Because we're too focused on getting what we want. We miss the joy of helping someone else get what they want. 
When we're only invested in our own happiness, we miss the opportunity to expand our joy. This is a really simple idea. Selflessness sets us up for joy. When we begin to humbly invest in the good of others, we simply have more opportunities to celebrate and experience joy because we're not the only person we're investing in and celebrating. So this week, why don't you give it a shot? Just pick one selfless act to try out this week or, or maybe before the end of the year. Try investing in the people around you and then finding joy in the good that comes into their lives. I mean, write someone a note of encouragement and buy them a coffee gift card and put it on their desk. But don't sign it so you don't get credit. But just show them that they're valuable. And when you start to complain, just catch yourself and back up and pause and remember that there are other ways to experience deep joy than just getting what you want and what is best for you. Take on the attitude of Jesus. Use your influence, your energy, your power, your authority for the good of others and increase the return on your investment. Joy celebrates the success of others, so don't miss out on it. And I know some of you right now, you're not getting a lot of joy out of life. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry that life is challenging and you've been hurt and you wake up every single day just trying to survive. And while I wish I could snap my fingers and give you all your dreams, I can't. But I also know this from experience, that even in your current series, season of life, selflessness will set you up to discover joy because joy isn't dependent on your circumstances. It's possible because you know who you are and whose you are. You're loved by your heavenly father more than you can imagine. You bring him joy just the way you are. You matter to him. And if you've never experienced his unconditional love, I want to invite you to accept it today. If you struggle to believe it's true for you, I want you to live this week as if it's true and see what a difference it makes. And if you need some joy, I want you to trust him enough to value others like he values you. And when you discover his joy in that, you also find his strength and you will have meaning in the middle of the mess and madness because he loves to give us joy.